You're listening to the Knowledge Archives podcast. Welcome to the Knowledge Archives podcast, where a group of students on a mission to learn from as many different disciplines as possible. I'm your host, Eileen Farnood, and today I have the pleasure to be joined by Dr. Eva Kopelhus, an assistant professor and curator of paleobotany and paleonology at the Department of Biological Sciences of the University of Alberta. Her research interest concentrates on floras of the Upper Cretaceous of Northwestern North America. She primarily works with material from dinosaur bearing formations, such as the Patrovinosaurus bone bed in Pipestone Creek, the Albertosaurus bone bed in Dry Island Park, and the Danek bone bed in Edmonton. Her work has taken her to all corners of the world, including Antarctica, Madagascar, Mongolia, New Zealand, and many more countries. In June of 2011, she received the Stefansson Medal of the Explorers Club for outstanding contributions to paleontological field research, and in March 2012, she received the Antarctica Service Medal of the United States of America in recognition of valuable contributions to both exploration and scientific achievement under the U.S. Antarctic Program. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm extremely excited to get to know more about you and learn more about paleobotany as a whole. So to begin, could you give a brief introduction of yourself and explain some of your major research interests? Yes, I'm Eva Kobbelhus and I work at the University of Alberta. I take care of the paleobotany and paleontology collections. And those two words are big words, they really means that I take care of a lot of rocks where there are traces of plant material in. And then I also take care of a collection of slides that you can put into a microscope and look at. And these slides contain spores and pollen from past times. And the collection is one of the biggest collections for paleobotany and paleontology. In, in Canada, but it has been dormant for some years because the previous professor decided to leave and the university didn't replace her until uh, later I came into the picture in 2015. And it's been a lot of fun to uh, work with students and the collections and uh, I certainly have enjoyed my time there. Mm -hmm. And what have been some of the studies that you've conducted with these fossils? So some of my studies have involved going along together with other researchers like sedimentologists, geologists, and other paleontologists looking for fossils. And in that way, you, you know, you get a better understanding of the uh, geological environment you get into when you work together with the people who also know more about the geology than I do. And the first uh, big project I was involved, was, it, involved with was in Dinosaur Provincial Park in the southern part of uh, Alberta. And uh, we were collecting material from the bone beds that were mostly accumulations of ceratopsian bones, so Centrosaurus. And we wanted to find out if all these different bone beds that we found scattered around in the park belong to the same event or if they were, you know, different scenarios, different times and so on. And that was why we, uh, we collected, you know, both material from the bone beds for vertebrate paleontology, but also for paleontology. And we were also looking for fossils, uh, macro fossils for paleobotany. But unfortunately, there wasn't so much of that. And so aside from like collecting fossils of plants, pollen, spores, etc., do you also look into dinosaurs or is that like no, out of the scope? I, uh, I leave that to those guys who are qualified to do that. But I do often have a situation where when I get to a site for collecting material for paleontology, I just need a, a sample of sediment. So if I work together with a geologist, we usually make a section and then take samples sort of like above the bone bed, in the bone bed and below the bone bed. So mm -hmm. we can place it, right? And, and these samples are easy to take and uh, I just take them, label them and then uh, put them in a box and into the truck. And, and then 
I don't need to do more palynology. I just need to look for plant fossils. Mm -hmm. And the easiest way to look for plant fossils is uh, to participate in, in digging whatever, you know, dinosaur or bone bed that they are working in the other people. So I spent time working on dinosaur material. And I tell you, it's exciting to expose bones that are millions of years old. So I have enjoyed that part of my job too. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, like you've had the chance to visit numerous countries, I think, around the world as a result of your research. So I thought it'd be interesting if we could discuss more of like what the actual process is like to conduct field work. I know you already mentioned you tend to concentrate your work around bone beds, but what's it like to go to these sites to collect data, bring it back? How often does this happen? And yeah, just in general, like this process, what's that like? Yeah, for many years, we, we did have a routine of working in Alberta during the Alberta summer. And then uh, often in the late summer, we would go and visit Mongolia and working with Mongolian paleontologists and go in the field in, in Mongolia. We would go out to the Gobi Desert where there are Cretaceous rocks, more or less the same age as here in Alberta. And often I was uh, participating as the logistic manager of the crew that was coming from Canada, all the financial stuff and all the, you know, making sure that we had all had the equipment we needed and so on. And then communicating with the Mongolian about when and where and how much and so on. So we did do that for many years and it was very beneficial. Lots of papers came out of that. So that was in our late summer. And then um, in early part of what would you call it, the uh, winter semester in February or March, we had a project uh, also for several years that was established in uh, Argentina near the mountains, uh, not, not sort of very close to the mountains, but also in an area, the province that we worked in is Neuquén, and the rocks there are also similar to the rocks that we have here in Alberta. So it was kind of interesting to be able to work in similar age rock, but, you know, the dinosaurs were different and uh, the plants were different and that was uh, exciting and again my entrance into all this was helping with all the logistic but then I could also use my expertise as a palynologist and, and paleobotanist so um, that went on as I said at least for 10 years and then over the years, you know, you get many contacts in different places of the world. And somehow we ended up getting invited to go with an American crew to Antarctica. And that was a place that I think I had never thought I would go to. Mm -hmm. I had read a lot about it and it was, uh, it was very exciting. And we went together with a crew that came from different places, but the main person came out of Augustiana College, which is from town in Iowa. He's retired now, but he put the uh, expedition together and to go to Antarctica is a very expensive project. So we personally had nothing to do with that. We didn't have anything to do with any logistics because working with the American Antarctic uh, program means that you fly to New Zealand and on the South Island of New Zealand, there's a town city called Christchurch and the American has a sort of a, a base, a, an equipment storage there where you go in and you simply get outfitted with all the clothes that you need for being in you know freezing cold environment all the time so you get your equipment and then you fly into a place called McMurdo and and that is also an American sort of base where they constantly have people there and the first you do there is really get trained in uh, in being in the uh, environment there because it is so cold and you can make small mistakes and it can be deadly so 
the first week was really learning how to um, not get in trouble. And then after that, we were in a camp 600 kilometers from the South Pole on something, a ridge, uh, a mountain ridge called the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. And every day when the weather was good, we would fly with a little helicopter up to the mountain where there were fossils. And I would look for plant fossils and the rest of the crew would be digging for dinosaur. They, they knew there was a dinosaur that they wanted to finish digging out. So, But, you know, at times I would come and, and help them too. But that was maybe the most extreme environment I have been working in. But I would say to all those young people who might hear this podcast that if you ever get into any kind of work that would allow you to go to Antarctica, don't shy away from it. And it is a very exciting thing to do. And I am glad I had the opportunity. So there you are. It's like you think maybe that it's too dangerous and it's... It's too cold and, you know, you can come up with all sorts of excuses for not doing it. But, but you learn a tremendous amount by, by traveling and, and trying that. I know in these times, um, the least thing we are thinking about right now is traveling. <laughs> but hopefully it will change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a crazy experience. But also, it seems so fascinating, too. Was there like a huge difference between the fossils that you found in Antarctica versus what you found in other parts of the world? I'm not too familiar with that. No, but, but you are, you, your question is spot on because mm-hmm. there is a big difference. The fossils in Antarctica are often in, in very hard rock mm-hmm. where you don't actually use the same method to take the fossils out as you do in Alberta and Mongolia and Argentina. Because you don't need the plaster and burlap. If you are familiar with it here in Alberta, we always expose the bones, if we are talking about bones, and then we cover them with paper towel, and then we wrap them with the burlap, which is soaked in plaster, to protect them for the transportation back home. In Antarctica, there was no need for this because the rock was so hard that you know we could just put these big pieces of rock in a in a net and then a helicopter would actually come and hover over the the spot and then we would clip on the net and then the helicopter would bring the rock down into where we had the camp. The reason why we couldn't camp on the mountain is that, you know, the air is so thin that a lot of people cannot handle being in, in this low oxygen for so long and it also makes you get yourself exhausted faster because you're lacking oxygen every time you breathe. So a very interesting and weird environment to be in. And then what's also strange is, of course, the wildlife is reduced to a few birds that you see. And really, if you are along the coast, you probably see more, but we were inland, if you can imagine that. And it... The time of the year that you would work there would be there, summer, which is, you know, December and January, where it's our winter here in the north. So we spent pretty much part of December and all of January, and we didn't make it home until in the middle of February. So it's, uh, it's very different. And uh, again, I would encourage anybody who have the opportunity to, to not shy away from such an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I know you briefly talked about this before, but right now, situations are entirely different with COVID-19. So I know much of your work is focused on actually going to these sites and conducting research there. So currently, how have you been adapting to these conditions? It, it has been difficult, but when it all happened uh, here in Alberta, I, I don't know if the east part of the country had the same experience, but around the 11, 12th of March, mm-hmm. it was like I was getting very nervous about the situation at the university because, uh, you know, the world was suddenly looking a lot different. 
And I said to my students that week of March 13th, I think 13th was on the Friday, but I, that Monday I said to my students that I was teaching paleobotany, I said, if you have not downloaded all the material from the, you know, the e-class and, and the university library and so on, you should do it now because as soon as, as the university closed, because I had a feeling that that would happen, then you need to be able to continue studying at home. And, and if you can't download it from your home address, then you are in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the students thought I was a little strange, but lo and behold, by Friday morning, I got the message from the university that all classes were suspended. And by Monday, I had to teach online. I can tell you that was a steep learning curve because yeah. although I was used to speak with students in the class, it was different to sort of sit in front of your computer and, and talk to the computer. And we did have um, classes on Google Meet, I think it was called. And I did speak with the students, but the whole thing was unfamiliar both to the students and to me. So in the beginning, it was a little awkward. And I think <laughs> the students missed the classes as much as, as I did because it was, it was a very different way of, of teaching. And of course, I couldn't do the same things that I did every time I met with the students. I tried to sort of encourage them to, to think and explore in their mind what, what they could find out about a fossil. So every lecture, I had lectures with them every second day in the week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I would bring a fossil down or something that looked like a fossil. And I called it a teaser. And I wanted them to look at it and see if they could figure out what it was. And often it would be something that was included in the lecture that I was giving that day. And then if they were observant, they, you know, in the end of the lecture, they knew what it was. But, but sometimes maybe I had covered it up too much that they didn't, you know, figure it out right away. But mm -hmm. things like that was impossible to do when I was suddenly doing the teaching online. And then also more sort of the, the social aspect of being able to talk with students in a casual way about how they were doing and, you know, how their other classes were going. And, and that was, yeah, I, I felt I missed very much the interaction with the students. Did you experience also being taught online? Yeah, yeah. Our school transitioned to online classes in March as well because we had March break and then right after that we were fully online so it was definitely a different experience especially with online exams yeah well but it's good to hear that you were able to adapt even though as you mentioned the learning curve may have been steep like in these situations you just have to hope for the best and hopefully in September things will get better um, yeah but, we'll have but this year has been uh, you know very trying mm -hmm. and and we have had to cancel all field schools and all field work usually we are spending may and june in the field here in alberta and then july has mostly been that we have sometimes been able to go to mongolia and work there uh, still but this year we just uh, we just had to cancel everything because the university uh, also have certain rules and these rules are so strict that it is impossible to take students out and what we have done now is we have uh, been allowed to take our field school online i know this sounds crazy but some of these students uh, need this field school to finish and graduate mm -hmm. and then it seemed like too bad for those students that you know they would not have the experience of the hands-on but we can still we can still teach them a lot online so uh, we, are, we are actually starting in September and giving them this field school it will run from beginning of September to the end of November and uh, I think we are doing the best we can under the circumstances to give the students an idea of what field work is like and and what the original field school 
was we have also been allowed to meet with a few students at a time at the field site because here in Edmonton, where University of Alberta is, we are privileged in the sense that the field site is just in the south end of the city. So you can take a, a public transportation or you can bike or you can, uh, if you are lucky enough to have a car or can borrow your parents' car, then you can actually drive there and we can meet with a few students at a time and show them the site and, and you know, some of the tools and and what we're doing out there. And yeah, I am have to say that even though it's a very limited field school, I'm looking forward to be able to, to do this. And I'm hoping that the students will get something out of it. Yeah, for sure. Just going back to your research really quickly, I have one more question to ask with regards to like the fossils that you've collected from various sites. So, Personally, I'm not entirely sure, but like what happens to the fossils after you've collected them? What have been some of the studies that you performed on them? And then after that, what do you exactly do with the fossils? So if we are out in an area where we find paleobotanical material, paleobotanical material can have many preservations, but the most common is that you find compression or impression fossils. So you split a rock and then you suddenly see a leaf. And if you find several leaves in the same general area, you will wrap them up in, in newspaper and mark them for where you found them in the quarry and then put them together in a box so they can safely travel to the university. And then when you are at the university, you unpack them and you label them. You identify what is on the uh, rock if it's a leaf from a flowering plant or if it's a twig from a conifer or you know if you can already there see that oh this is an aquatic plant or you know whatever you fill that in and then we have a, a cataloging system where we put all this information in we give them a number each rock will have a number and we uh, put them into the system and then you find space and where you can uh, put them until you start researching them. When you do the research, you often take pictures of the fossils and with a scale bar. And all depending on their preservation, then you know you might be able to even find that there is a tiny layer of organic material left, what which is called the cuticle. And you if you can lift that off and put it on a slide, you will be able to see the stomata. And some plants have very characteristic stomata, and therefore you can maybe identify what kind of plant it is. But it's not so common, maybe. And then sometimes if the rock looks sort of dark with some clay in it, then I will also take samples for palynology and the preparation for palynology, I don't do myself. I send it to the, a lab in Medicine Head in the southern part of Alberta. And there, here they uh, take the minerals away by putting the sediment, the rock piece in acid. Well, actually they, they crush down the rock piece first and then they put it in acid and then they rinse it. The acid is a very harsh acid. It's called HF hydrofluoric acid. Every work you do with that you have to be in a fume hood but it takes away the minerals and what you are left with is the organic matter. It is pretty amazing that the organic matter doesn't get damaged and then you rinse it and you put a small drop of this organic matter on a slide and then you can look at it and see if it is actually a sample that yields spores and pollen from plants from that time period where you were digging, right? Sometimes it can be contaminated, but most of the times what you find is uh, if it is a good sample, then you can find hundreds of small spores and pollen. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it's a... Uh, it's a neat study, but it's time consuming when you're doing it. You know, the, the, the real time you put in is when you are studying this material in the microscope. Mm -hmm. All right. So one more question before we wrap up. Looking at 
paleobotany and I guess paleonology as a whole. Why do you think these fields are so important and what influence do these fields have on both our environment and society? Because I know a lot of us, when we think about fossils or we think about this like the past, it's hard to draw those connections towards like, why is this actually really essential for us to study at the moment? I think it's very important that we know something about the past, you know, past environments and, and see how things has evolved. And the more you know about the past, you can, uh, you can maybe help predict how things are going to be for us in the future. Therefore, I, I strongly believe that we have to keep working with these uh, sciences. I know they are not maybe as exciting as other sciences because we are talking about dusty rocks and so on. But you also have to realize that now with all the different research that is done on relationship phylogeny, on recent plants, on plants we have out around us today, they do a lot of molecular biology. And if they want to know anything about what was before, you know, they have to look into the fossil record. So with fossils, we can't do the same things that we can do with the extant plants, but we usually do all our family, our uh, phylogeny, by uh, looking at the morphology of the fossil plants. And I know that it is uh, maybe difficult to understand, but there is a lot of people out there that work with the fossil plant and they, they say, this is what you can find out by looking at the fossil plants. And this is how we think they relate to what we have of plants today. And it, the, the method is two different methods. And the more we study these things and the better we become at it, you know, I think we will find more information that can be important for us in, in the future. So uh, I would say keep at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, I have loved what I've been doing in my time as a you know researcher and uh, i will keep doing it until i get too old but when you are so privileged that you have a job that is more than a job it's, it's mm -hmm. like something you believe strongly in and i i believe very strongly in that plants are super important and i know that we all take them for granted because they are just all around us but think about how important they are as uh, food, as building material, and as just making an environment uh, tolerable to live in. Plants is really important for all of us. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, I guess that wraps things up. But thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to speak with me. This is definitely a super insightful conversation and I've learned a lot about paleobotany. I had like barely any idea of what exactly the field meant going in, but it's such an amazing field and it's been super cool to hear about the research that you've done. So thank you. You're very welcome. And um, I think you asked me if there was any way that students can contact me and you do have my email, so you can just let them use the email.